I have the honor of um, introducing tonight's key keynote, which um, for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Ron Rosmi, he really is somebody who, we, we thought about whether or not we were gonna do a panel tonight, and then we decided we don't really need a panel because we have so many different points of view just in one person presenting tonight. Um, if you don't know Ron, then, um, then you might not know a couple of things that are critical about him and his, his place in, in the, the global dialogue that, that's going on in healthcare and AI. First of all, Ron is a cardiologist. And, um, and as a Mayo Clinic trained cardiologist brings that kind of perspective as an actual practitioner in the space. But beyond that, Ron then went on to, um, to, go, to, uh, to go to business school to get his MBA at University of Chicago. And, um, and sorry, Northwestern. Northwestern, sorry, in Chicago at Northwestern, sorry about that. that yeah, I know, I knew you were gonna call me out on that. Sorry, I was thinking about Chicago. Um, at Northwestern, uh, and had the opportunity to, uh, to be a, le a thought leader in his class there at Northwestern. Then beyond that, he had the opportunity to go on um, to McKinsey to be a consultant, uh, where he advised in the healthcare space and helped build businesses as an advisor in this space, and then finally was an entrepreneur in his own right uh, when he launched his company, Acupair. And so uh, it's, it's not a euphemism, right? You really are getting the, the perspective of a, of a practicing physician, a trained MBA, a McKinsey consultant, and, uh, and an entrepreneur who launched a successful company in this space. Uh, and then when you, if you had a chance to read the book, or if you do have a chance to read the book, you'll see that all of that is captured here. And he gives all of those different perspectives in the book, and then has the opportunity um, alongside the book and on the foundation of the knowledge in the book to go on with his partner, Brian Beeler, who's also here in the room, to simultaneously bring a, um, bring a fund together in the space that's built on the thesis developed in the book. Um, so tonight you're gonna have the opportunity to hear Ron talk a little bit about the history of the technology and the AI and the development, and then a fireside chat uh, with Ian from the Foreign Press Association. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, and then we'll have the book signing after. So please stick around for the whole evening. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you, Ron. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming and thanks for the warm introduction from Matt. Uh, let me tell you, wildly exaggerated. <laughs> so, um, as I was thinking about tonight and what I want to talk about, because I spent three years writing the book and it was greatly assisted by the fact that we had the pandemic and there were the lockdowns and I couldn't do anything else. That really accelerates the timelines when you're writing a book. But, um, I thought about a story that I read in New York Times about uh, an article in 1894 when they were talking about the challenges facing New York City for the new century. At the near the turn of the 20th century, the challenges facing New York City, and the number one challenge was the fact that horse manure was going to be up uh, three stories in every building and how the city was going to deal with it and so forth. So the fact of the matter is, depending on what is going on at the time, depending on our point of view at that moment in time, we may be underestimating or overestimating the challenges in front of us and not thinking about the solutions that make those uh, challenges obsolete. So humans have been on the planet for about 300,000 years. Until a couple of hundred years ago, we really couldn't do diddly-do about anything. Like we had no tools, no automation, no mechanization, none of this stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, when I gave a talk at Davos, at the World Economic Forum uh, a few months ago, uh, I talked about, at, Healthcare today is where agriculture was in the 1850s. And you're like, how is that possible? We're curing types of cancers. We have MRIs. We have robotic surgery. The delivery of healthcare right now is very primitive. You guys are walking around doing whatever you want to do. Nobody's keeping an eye on you. You can go, you go in and get medical care whenever you feel pain or you think something is wrong or an annual physical. However, 
No, no technology is really keeping an eye on you and figuring out what's about to happen and uh, preventing it and making sure the right outcome happens. Uh, that's how agriculture was in 1850s. I mean, the, uh, the guys were going and, you know, checking on every crop and making sure it was watered and so forth. Today, the soil is prepared, everything, there are sensors and you find out if there's an infection that's coming. Everything is being done uh, in a much more automated, obviously, it's all mechanized and so forth. So think about healthcare being today, how we deliver health and how we ensure health and how we deliver healthcare from the point of view of what was going on back in the 1850s. Of course, in the last 100 years, a lot has happened. I name a few things, anesthesia, yeah, as a matter of fact, if something needed to be cut out, out of you 100 years ago, you needed to deal with the pain. Like you actually laid there and maybe took some whiskey and uh, they, they did what they needed to do. Vaccines, uh, tremendous innovation. Uh, antibiotics allowed us to live beyond 35 years old. If we got, a, if we got an infection, we didn't die from that. So. If you think about what happened for 300,000 years, and then the last 200 out of those 300,000 years, there's a tremendous, like everything that we're doing, everything we know has happened in the last uh, two centuries. So um, what was the difference? What happened that in the last 200 years, uh, we made, we've made tremendous progress, including in healthcare? Well, you know, there was the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we created wealth. We used that wealth to do research. We created institutions. A lot of things came together in order to do that. And as a result of it now, we live 80 years to 80 years. Life expectancy is around 80 years instead of 35 years, which is what it was about 100 years ago. So with that progress comes a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges. Some of the challenges are the fact that uh, as we're living longer, uh, somebody needs to take care of us when we get to be 85 years or 90 years or whatever. Uh, we may develop dementia. Uh, people who live longer live long enough to develop hypertension and all kinds of other problems that require ongoing management. As a result of it, almost every industrialized nation, their budget, their federal budgets are fully stretched. And a lot of it is healthcare dollars that they spend to take care of people. And most of it is around chronic diseases. And uh, there are opportunities to improve that. But what is the main barrier for us providing uh, better care and preventing chronic diseases from being so costly? And um, doing the types of things that uh, make um, quality of life better, but also if you, don't, if you don't develop kidney disease from hypertension, you can live an extra 10 years and so forth. So the number one issue right now is manpower. We know what needs to be done, but we can't do ongoing monitoring, responding to what the monitoring data shows and taking actions to mitigate those issues. And as a matter of fact, we, we are short staffed to provide the type of care we're providing, the imperfect care we're providing today. Uh, based on that, we're gonna be about 25 to 30% short of uh, clinicians, nurses, physical therapists, and so forth in the last, in the next uh, five to seven years. So this is why those of us who have practiced medicine and uh, have, have been involved in technology uh, are excited about what AI could do in healthcare. When I practice medicine and I was seeing a patient, really the job is really simple. You're looking at information, you're figuring out what it means, and you're taking action as a result of it. That's all practicing medicine is, is reviewing an x-ray, listening to a patient's story, reviewing their labs, and then doing something as a result of what you learn. This happens to be extremely well suited for AI. AI is very good at analyzing data and figure out what it means. 
So what that means is there is an opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what that means is we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to start offloading a lot of what we do today to machines. Machines that can analyze data, machines that can figure out what needs to be done, and then take, take action so we can offload that. But that's not the only thing. There are other things we want. I think we want to live longer, much longer. The longevity stuff, and um, we'll get to that. Uh, we also want to live better quality of life. You know, I don't know about you guys, uh, I dread the day that somebody tells me I have cancer. Uh, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. I, I can, I can uh, live a full, meaningful life without having that experience. And what's exciting is using AI, using the methods that are at our disposal today, it is possible for us now to figure out if you're going to have cancer in 30, 40 years. We can figure out, we now know that the seeds of cancer or diseases you develop in your 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s uh, are sown decades ahead of time. And we can detect it and we can, do, we can prevent it. You have plenty of time. If you have a 40-year head start on a cancer, there are, there are plenty of things you can do to avoid it. So based on that, based on that, it, it's an exciting area to think about because uh, the benefits of improved health are tremendous. A study from McKinsey showed that 30% of all the economic gains from the last 200 years were explained by improved health. So when you have improved health, you have better horizons. You have the bandwidth to think about problems solve problems, conquer new frontiers. Um, and so this is an area where investing in it has direct benefits to all of us. And it has ripple effect. I mean, it's good not to be told that you have cancer and anticipate problems and address them. But also, it results in you having peace of mind, being more productive, more economic output, all of that good stuff. So there is a lot to be gained um, beyond just, you know, I'm not minimizing having good health, but having good health also results in a lot of other good things. So this is an area, if you have a dollar uh, to spend, if federal government wants to invest in different areas and uh, competing budgets and so forth, this is a great area to be investing public dollars or private dollars in because it, it results in tangible gains for all of us here. And all of us would like something like that. But uh, going beyond that, um, there, there is, there's been tremendous activity because this, this area is so promising. Uh, in the last five years, the amount of annual investments in health AI in the private sector has gone from less than a billion dollars to over $12 billion. In 2017, there were five FDA-approved AI applications. Now there are more than 692 or uh, some ridiculous number. But oddly enough, as I was writing my book, um, there weren't too many success stories that I could write about. That this particular uh, company solved this problem, and now you know, they've taken over the world or they're worth a billion dollars, or five billion dollars, or what have you. There were a few. There was Babylon. There was Olive. Success stories I had in the book. Let me tell you, before the book was going into publication in December, when I was signing off on the final versions of the chapters, I had to go in there and clean it up. Put now defunct Babylon, or... <laughs> Uh, company that's been shuttered, Olive, and so forth. And it's because the technology is new. There's not a lot of collective expertise in what to build, what to invest in. So consequently, a lot of the use cases that so far have been tried 
haven't provided value to the users, the buyers don't know what the business model is, the regulators are catching up with a fast moving technology. So I think what lies ahead, Newsweek did an article about the book, I convinced the reporter uh, not to get too excited about you know, how quickly longevity is gonna happen. A lot of the stuff we talk about is gonna take time. So fortunately the title was AI can uncover uh, insights about human body in the next couple of decades. So at least we, I was able to manage expectations to within a couple of decades. So um, I think uh, the takeaways from all of this is that there are great things ahead for all of us because of AI, because AI is powerful to analyze our genes, microbiome, all the molecules in our body and find those relationships and predict disease and uh, help us get ahead of, uh, ahead of disease, preventing it and so forth. However, a lot of this stuff is not gonna be happening overnight. There are use cases that are gonna be here and now for the next few years around radiology, around documentation, coding, the kinds of things that don't necessarily result in curing cancer, but they're gonna provide the experience, make experience of healthcare much better. And then there are gonna be medium and long-term use cases. And uh, what I've tried to do with the book is cr create a framework that's relevant around before you spend years building something, before you spend years um, in an area that uh, may not solve a problem that's a big pain point in healthcare today, you need to go through some analysis, forethought, in order to avoid uh, a situation where you've built something and nobody's interested in using it because it, what's, what's being used today is good enough. And if you look at the track record of technologies in this space to date, it's the fact that a lot of good enough use cases have been created and nobody's been interested in buying and using the technology. So uh, my objective with the book is to educate everybody involved in this ecosystem, the builders, the users, the buyers, the investors, provide them with a set of analysis which is gonna be as relevant today as it was 10 years ago, as it's gonna be 10 years from now, which is avoiding what I call the pets.com problem, where back when .com meant you can raise a lot of money and you had a business and people said the rules of business no longer apply because the internet economy is something entirely different, it turned out to be not, nothing of the sort. You still had to have a good business model, a revenue model, uh, all of that good stuff before you could, uh, you could have a viable business. It's the same thing here. Having AI in the name of your product or company is not going to buy you any users uh, or uh, adopters of your technology. You still have to do thinking. You still have to figure out who's going to use it, why are they going to use it, why can't they use something else? And if, if, they, if the people involved in this ecosystem apply this kind of thinking and analysis, they're gonna focus on achievable use cases in the short term. They're gonna create momentum. People are gonna see benefit. And then we live to fight another day and create the medium term use cases. And then we get to the long term use cases. And if we make the right decisions, I lay out the issues here for the policymakers that need to be done at the policy level. For example, creating a unified patient record that all of our data goes into one place rather than in multiple different places and so forth. Creating a streamlined um, approval process where the builders know what they're dealing with and so forth. If we make those decisions, we can expedite the benefits of this technology for all of us. If we don't, it's gonna take longer. So for me, it's the 300,000 years and the 200 years. For 300,000 years, we didn't do anything right. There was no progress. And then 200 year, in 200 years, we made some good decisions and it created a cycle where we've made a lot of progress. So how long is it gonna take for us to see these benefits? It's gonna depend on whether the 
the people involved in the ecosystem make the right decisions and do the right analysis up front and take the right steps. But I, what I was hoping to do is make a down payment towards that by uh, creating the thinking and the framework uh, that uh, different parties in this ecosystem could use as they, as they approach building that solution. So I'm gonna stop there and invite Ian to come and have a fireside chat. But thank you for your attention and coming. We were Sit discussing here. these, and one of the most convincing things about uh, Ron's uh, analysis is he is not Panglossian. <laughs> <laughs> he, he shares the skepticism of almost all of us uh, about these things. Uh, and I, if I can chip in with an anecdote, uh, once upon a time, across the road here, I think it was at uh, the hospital across the road, I went in because I had a broken nose and I was getting a deviated septum. Who we'll kicked your ass? <laughs> Should have seen him. <laughs> so he was, coming to, he was coming to do it, and this lovely young doctor, she said to me, I think there's something wrong here, and this is for the pre-op. So I looked down, what could be wrong? And then she turned the thing round. I was going in for ablation and curatage. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Dilation and curatage, oh. and removal of endocervical polypses. Oh, really? I said, through my right nostril? <laughs> you know, this was miraculous. Mm -hmm. I was trying to work out what happened. Luckily, human intervention, both of us said, no way. And then I realized that oat, oat rin mm -hmm. is next to ob gin. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> and the codes had slipped. And I was very glad there was a human intervention here. <laughs> I tell you what, that's, that's a, that's a, that's not good. However, <laughs> it's not like they were going to take the wrong kidney. They would have figured I out. I crossed That's my legs. Right. I crossed my legs before we went any further, <laughs> firmly. Um, <clears throat> but it's this, uh, the hum I mean, human error is something that people always worry about. And, uh, you know, there's a, a Luddite fear of artificial intelligence. I'd welcome any signs of intelligence more often mm -hmm. than not, because it is something that is missing <laughs> frequently. Uh, and... Not to mention, I think uh, Ron and I were discussing, there's a monastery near Edinburgh mm -hmm. where they found a garden that had hugely rich soil filled with iron. And then they realized this was the place where the monks and doctors, every time they bled a patient for 700 years, poured the blood into this garden. Wow. So this is 700 years of biological investment. <laughs> in a completely destructive medical technology <laughs> that nobody has said, whoops, okay, they didn't do the double blind tests. <laughs> they carried on bleeding those patients until they died. <laughs> wow. Year after year. And, you know, I often think that doctors do are very traditional and they do carry on. So you're having, talking about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. how does it reconcile with doctors who are sometimes, uh, they, they look up in their book and say, well, we've, we, we've always given people laxatives for this, so I'll carry on giving them laxatives, right. you know. <laughs> you know, I think, um, first of all, changing practice is very difficult. And we've seen this. When I started my company back in 2011, I was so naive and stupid uh, because I had already been a cardiologist. I had actually been involved in developing the first uh, sequences that enabled uh, MRI machines to do cardiac imaging. So I have technology development and then a business person. So I thought I've been around different areas of healthcare. I know something about healthcare to, to, to build a company in it. And then the years that I was developing the Acupera technology and we were uh, bringing that technology into medical centers, what I realized is that I really didn't know anything. It's a whole different world when you're on the other side of it. And uh, getting doctors to change their patterns, and um, even if you're assisting them, they may not be interested. So I think one of the things we've learned from digital health first 15 years is that unless you're making somebody's job easier, unless you're making money for someone, 
um, you're driving a high-speed car into an immovable object, into a building, that nobody is really readily embrace technology and change their practice and uh, run outside naked and said, give me AI now or I'll stab myself. None of that, no, no such thing has happened. So uh, it goes to the point of the book around you really need to think before you do anything in terms of who's going to use this, why are they going to use it, are you creating more work or are you uh, uh, removing work? What's going to happen to their economics? Well, I mean, what, most of these FDA applications on AI that have been developed to date are in radiology. And uh, I was saying that about um, 10 years ago, I was on a panel discussion with Vinod Kosla, who's a legendary Silicon Valley investor, especially invests in healthcare. He said, in five years, we're not going to need radiologists. This is 10 years ago. Our shortage of radiologists today is more than it's ever been. And one of the things that happened is American College of, Cardiology, uh, Car American College of Radiology moved in and made sure AI technologies don't cost any radiologists their jobs <laughs> or remove a dollar from, from their income. They've taken over the space, they're writing the rules and making sure. So when you're saying that, I don't have an answer for it. You can't force anyone to change uh, how they do things and the force of habit is very strong. You will need to bring, bring benefit to them. Like if they're typing their note and now you can automatically create that note, for, they'll, they'll embrace, it, embrace it in a second because you're bringing a tangible benefit to them today. You, uh, you mentioned the benefits of AI and uh, reconciling different sources and forms of information or the potential benefits, because we haven't seen the benefits yet. I think you also point out. Uh, very know. little. <laughs> yes. So how, um, if you pull those together, you, there are very real fears about privacy and control. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a single, you know, a, a single reconcilable database mm -hmm. with everything's there. I'm not sure I want my um, potential womb scraping to be advertised to the world. Right. Well, hopefully it's not being advertised, but I mean, it's, it's not good. Like I had um, a severe biking accident in, uh, back in September, and they had to bring an ambulance and scrape me off the sidewalks um, by George Washington Bridge, and they loaded me into an ambulance and took me to... Uh, Harlem Hospital, they had none of my records because I go to NYU and Cornell and so forth. And, you know, I survived the accident. Uh, and then when I was seeing my doctor at Cornell, he had none of my, the records of my accident. That's not a good thing. So, and one of the things that I always say, everybody needs to keep something in mind about healthcare. Um, I can have some of your data from your shopping habits on Amazon. I can have some of your data from what you watch on Netflix. And we can extrapolate things about your habits on shopping or what you like to watch from that. And that's good enough. They can recommend things for you and uh, they can make your experience better. If I have all of your records for your entire life, until yesterday in one place, but yesterday you had a lab draw someplace else. Um, your entire first however many years up until yesterday is nullified because there could be something on that that says your kidney function is suddenly has had a massive downturn and uh, without having that information, I'm gonna think your kidney function is normal and I can give you a medication that could kill you tonight. So one piece of information completely changes the healthcare picture. So that's why, in spite of the risk, in spite of the fact that nobody wants to be on a list or government to have all their data, the uh, um, time-honored tradition, this uh, distrust of government, which is very typical for us Americans. Um, unfortunately, in, with healthcare data, that causes problems. Like, we need all of your data in one place. When I go to Harlem Hospital, they should be able to load up my records immediately and see 
my medical history, and then whatever they do there should add to that data. Now, if you ask me what's stopping that from happening, it's the influence of big money on our public policy. That's one of the big problems we have, at least in America, is the fact that hospital systems and uh, electronic health record companies effectively lobby against creating a national medical record where every institution feeds, you have a unique identifier and they feed all of your data into that, into that database. There's no telling where it could lead. Single payer healthcare system or something like God that. God forbid. <laughs> you know, Social Rocky Road to <laughs> But uh, on this, you mentioned the big money. Um, where is the money? Where is the future? Is it in terms of investment? By the way, we should confess an interest here. Journalism, believe it or not, was one of, you know, in the absence of real intelligence, they introduced artificial intelligence. A lot of financial papers, a lot of financial systems. But just before COVID, I was following it, they suddenly realized that if they downloaded the stock market reports, the quarterlies and the rest of it, they had an artificial intelligence program to write the newspaper reports. So-and-so mm -hmm. shares are up so much, prognosis good, et cetera, et cetera, just slotted in. And that was fairly straightforward algorithms. So I, I can see more of that coming. How do we work this with them? Um, I'm careful about saying AI, because it also stands for artificial insemination, which might be yeah. a bigger... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it might be a bigger sell, who knows? Um, but a AI is, uh, is um, it's, it's worrying in the sense that nobody knows what it is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of potential for the emperor's new clothes here. You can sell. Well, you, you mentioned the dot coms. If people don't understand something, what was it? Is it Theranos? Theranos. Theranos, which Elizabeth was the, uh, yeah, yeah, which was effectively. Um, it was the emperor's new clothes in a bottle. You know, I, I, we were part of a group because I was building Acupera at the same time. She was building Theranos in San Francisco. We would go out to dinner on Tuesday nights. And here's this little dweeb, like 20-year-old who's built, who's building a diagnostics company. And meanwhile, I'm, you know, a Mayo Clinic cardiologist. I'm asking her best basic medical questions at various dinners over the years. And her answers were like so vague and I couldn't, I couldn't understand what she was doing. It's always a problem when somebody The Empress explain. Taylor's never described the clothes. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think we know AI is real. I think uh, the capabilities are gonna be tremendous for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, for, for us to analyze our genomes, understand the relationship between our genes and disease. Microbiomes, we have trillions of bacteria and viruses in our gut. To analyze how we digest food, how that affects our health, we're talking about tremendous amount of data and information, gene, billions of genes, trillions of microbiomes. We need AI to analyze this information to know what all of this means for our health. So AI is not going to be a luxury. It's going to be a necessity, at least in medical research. We don't, we don't have any other methodologies to analyze that information. We would have to do the old-fashioned way of doing one experiment at a time. That's going to take decades and centuries to uncover the insights that we can potentially do in a couple of decades and years and decades with, with AI. Uh, but preparing all this data, collecting it, uh, developing the algorithms that are gonna do that, that's going to take time. So if anybody's coming to you and saying, I'm gonna use AI to analyze your data, your microbiomes, or give me some blood, um, and I, I can prescribe supplements for you that prolong your life or improve your health, and uh, you're willing to buy that stuff, you should, also, you should also see me afterwards. I have some other stuff I can sell you. <laughs> There's a bridge just on the road <laughs> yeah, exactly. waiting. <laughs> uh, we're, we're not there yet. However, that doesn't mean there are not businesses that are doing that right now. Companies that are saying, I, I'm going to use AI on your data and tell you how to eat. 
Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe them they're, either. They're, they're, they're written about in the book, and uh, I also provide context. <laughs> so where, where is it going to go next? Because, I mean, obviously, you know, you just have to think of something like um, VHS versus Beta. The, the, the technology followed the money in the end. Right. You know, uh, once, once, once it was decided that Beta was okay for up to a point, but VHS was the way to go, that's when uh, that, that, yeah. that, you know, the, the whole market was wiped out. Where is this going to go? Is it going to be in diagnostics? Is it going to be in treatment? Is it going to be in investment analysis? Right. What, you know, what systems should we, what should we invest in? I think, I think um, what happens next depends on some of, the, some of the things that I mentioned in terms of policy, unified patient records, um, providing discipline to, buy, to builders and investors. So they're focusing on achievable use cases. Uh, what we do know is from the first five, six years of uh, AI in healthcare, a lot's been created, but we haven't seen a lot of adoption. We haven't seen a lot of success stories. I was giving a talk, uh, I was part of a panel discussion for United Nations on health equity and whether artificial intelligence uh, facilitates that or actually worsens the problem of health equity. What I mentioned was the best way to get to the best algorithm, to a perfect algorithm is an imperfect algorithm. It's okay if our initial attempts have failed. That's how science works. The fact that people are actually out there making mistakes, building the wrong use cases, building the wrong technology, is a step in the right direction. But if we don't learn from those mistakes, if every, anybody who comes in and says, I'm building AI to do X, Y, and Z, and it's gonna be great, they can raise money, and they can go out and spend years building something, and then it doesn't result in anything, it's not going to, it's not going to move forward as quickly as it can if better decisions are made in terms of where you focus the research, informing buyers on who, how to evaluate between um, medical centers and pharma companies are bombarded with people trying to sell them to, to, with technology. So I have a chapter in the book, how do you choose the right technology for your business? So if, if you're making the right decision on what technologies to bring, for example, if you have issues in your radiology department, you bring a radiology AI solution that helps make your staff more efficient and you see some benefits, it engenders good feelings towards the technology. You're more likely to invest in it. If everything you bring in bombs, at some point you're like, you know, this is wasting my time and money. Let me focus on something else. So where is it going? I'm hoping I've made a contribution to help everybody make better decisions, uh, but also you have to fight the influence of big money on public policy in order to create the infrastructure that allows these solutions to um, find their place. And if you don't have a unified patient record, it makes it much harder to bring these technologies and enjoy the benefits that they can provide in managing patients. Mm, we've burnt the fire, so we've, we've, we've had us. Uh oh, cookies in the fireplace for a while. Uh, what about people out there in the audience? Have you got any questions? Wow, yes, well done. <laughs>